Welcome back, my armoured fanatics. I hope you're having a great day, and thank you for joining me today. It's me, Matsmus. Today we are talking about anti-tank guided missile platforms, and of course, Soviet missile platforms in particular. The Cold War was a whole host of anti-tank guided weapons platforms from all over the world, and it's a very interesting era for, you know, weapon systems of this kind, because it really brought the anti-tank guided weapon systems into the spotlight and into a more viable weapon system to use on the battlefield. Today, though, I want to talk about Soviet missile carriers and Soviet missile tanks. There is a whole host of them, the BMP-1 being one that we're very familiar with, with its own anti-tank weapon system on top, and a whole host of other vehicles out there that you're seeing today on this video. However, I would like to hone in on something a little bit more specific. The Object 287 that really got pushed into the shadows of anti-tank weapons platforms. Now, Soviet missile tanks are, without a doubt, one of the less known, but at the same time, most intriguing chapters of Cold War armor development. In short, anti-tank guided missiles were seen as the future due to their advantages. Note the parallel between the Soviet Union and the DIVAD program history. And what followed was a costly series of programs, which was common in the Soviet Union with multiple design bureaus working on the same topic and provided competing prototypes that ultimately ended in the limited production of the IT-1 Nisir Tagil. But today, we will discuss one of the unsuccessful competitors, the Object 287. By 1961, the IT-1 was still in development and the project was really not doing all that great, partially due to the number of unreasonable demands personally submitted by the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, Nikita Khrushchev. Because we all know that meddling from above always ends great. The project was delayed several times, and it was likely one of the impulses that prompted the Kirov plant in Leningrad to work on a design of their own, resulting in the prototype called the Object 287. The project was launched by the official designation of the Soviet Council of the Ministers in February 1961. The Object 287 was, unlike the IT-1, based on a tank called the Object 432, which would enter service under the T-64 name. I've covered the, talking about this in a separate video, and you're more than welcome to go check it out. However, instead of the standard turret, the vehicle was to be armed with a guided missile system developed just like the IT-1's Dracon, and the OKB-16 design bureau under the AE Nudelmann. The initial project was finished by the end of 1961, and it was shown to the military at the beginning of 1962. After being approved for the prototype stage, the developers started working on figuring out the more minor details. The way they saw it, the IT-1 had a specific problem. It carried an accurate and quite powerful missile, and yes, the missile was fully capable of taking out pretty much any western tank of the era, but at the same time the age of IFEs had just begun, and even before the appearance of the Bradley, there were other softer targets on the battlefield that were nonetheless too well armoured to be taken out by a machine gun. In other words, the IT-1 would have had to waste an expensive missile to destroy western APCs or IFEs, and that just wouldn't do. To solve this problem, the designers proposed a unique combination of a multiple anti-armor weapon system. The tank was to carry not only a remote-controlled ATGM launcher, at that point the missile was considered designated the 301P, but also a pair of lighter anti-tank weapons, initially two 23mm autocannons that would be enough to take any such lighter targets out. Two prototypes were built between 1962 and the spring of 1964, and was sent to participate in factory trials. These trials went reasonably well, but some significant flaws were encountered, especially with the 301P missiles, which were not exactly reliable, and the 23mm autocannon setup was not really performing very well either. As a result, the turret was significantly overhauled to include two different weapon systems. There were two 73mm 2A25 Molina smoothbore guns replacing the autocannons, and the 9K11 Taft Fun launcher replacing the older one. The first weapon system sports a similar caliber, after all the BMP-1 also used the same one, although the gun was different, a 2A28 Grom. Not much info is really available on the 2A25 Molina. As far as could be discerned, it's somewhat shorter and automatically loaded. The muzzle velocity likely wasn't as very high as it really wasn't much of a gun, more like a large grenade launcher. The 2A25 was developed in Tula in 1960-1961, or so an offshoot of the TKB-04 project, which ended with the introduction of the 2A28, and even its name, Lightning, suggests that it was related to the Grom, or the Thunder Gun. 
It fired the same ammunition as the Grom, most notably the PG-15V heat round, penetrating roughly 300mm of steel armour under ideal circumstances, although the shell couldn't exactly be relied upon to do so in real life. The effective range of such weapon was around 500 to 700 meters at most. The Object 287 had two of these guns, both automatically loaded and each having a drum magazine of about 16 rounds. The second weapon system was the 9K11 Tash Fun, which was a 140mm anti-tank guided missile system consisting of one launch device and 15 9M11 missiles stored in the vehicle's hull. The loading process was heavily mechanised, with the missiles actually stored with their warheads to the back of the vehicle and had to be rotated 180 degrees horizontally during the process for loading. Each missile had a flight velocity of around 250 meters a second and could penetrate up to 500 millimeters of armour. In addition, the warm head had a very strong fragmentation effect equal to that of a 100 millimeter high explosive shell. The maximum range of these missiles was about 4 kilometers, and a minimum range for arming was about 500 meters. Both weapon systems were installed in a limited traverse 100 degrees to each side of the vehicle axis remote control turret. The 73mm guns were positioned on each side with the launcher in the middle. Each gun could elevate and depress independently, while the hydraulic launch arm between them deployed with the missile on it most of the time was hidden inside of the tank. This whole system was controlled by a group of two men, a driver and a weapons operator slash commander, sitting in the front of the vehicle where only the driver would normally be. The crew compartment was isolated from the rest of the vehicle and equipped with an NBC protection system. The commander had a panoramic sight system at his disposal, along with a 9SH-19 Saphir Day Passive Night Fully Stabilized Sighting System, effective after about 1200 meters. The driver had a night vision device called CLIN, Interestingly enough, this device was specifically designed with the missile tank requirements in mind. The entire vehicle weighed a hefty 36.5 tons and was powered by a 700 horsepower, 13.5 litre, 5TDF, 5 cylinder, 2 stroke supercharged engine. This allowed for a very impressive maximum speed of 66 km an hour and the tank was actually quite agile. By the May year of 1965, work begun on Object 287 prototypes. The upgraded of the vehicle was the Tafun Molina configuration, and very likely by modifying older ones. One additional hull was used and built for armor trials. A new round of testing began as soon as they were ready. These tests took place between 1965 and 1968. These tests show that the vehicle had its advantages as well as its drawbacks. When it comes to advantages, it's well protected, and the crew had a lot of tactical options thanks to its multiple weapon systems, allowing it to choose the right tool for every situation. There were, however, significant downsides to this configuration. For one, there was very little in terms of automation. The commander, weapons operator, had to do nearly all of the tasks manually, while actually commanding the vehicle and making his job extremely taxing. Especially the aiming process. Using the remote controls, it was very difficult, and it was discovered during the trials that due to this difficulty, the Object 287 would have no true advantage over the NATO tanks at 2 kilometers or closer. At longer distances, there were some advantages only thanks to the range of the Tafjan missiles. The 73mm guns were also deemed insufficiently accurate, and the only weapons that lived up to the expectations were, ironically, the vehicle's machine guns. One was paired with each gun. This, however, wasn't seen as much of a success, with the vehicle being much there to engage tanks and not infantry. There were also many other issues as well. The night sights just weren't really that great. There was a lot of image lagging, which meant that if the vehicle was moving at night, nobody could see anything. The Saphir optic system was too difficult to operate effectively, and several others were also trial but didn't quite work. All in all, the tank wasn't terrible, but it just wasn't good enough, and the Soviet military wasn't too excited about it either. It was a good start, but when the sum of all the test results came in, everybody realized that it would take years and a lot of money to fix all of these critical issues. And it just wasn't worth it, not with the BMP-1 already two years in production and much more mature IT-1s around the corner. As a result, on September 3rd, 1968, the Councils of Ministers issued the order to cancel Object 287 project and to focus on a new type of tank missile weaponry, gun-launched missiles, resulting a few years later in the Cobra ATGM for the T-64 Alpha. One Object 287 prototype was scrapped and the other one was mothballed, it is currently available for seeing in the Kubinka Museum. The competing IT-1 project didn't fare much better either though. 
it went into a very, very limited mass production and only stayed in service for a few years before being declared completely obsolete and finally ending the era of Soviet missile tanks. Of course, the history of this vehicle is rather interesting for the fact that it just had that little spark, that hope of glory that it could potentially be something special. But the configuration is very strange, you know. I can't quite understand why they want to put the guns on there with the missiles. It would have been nice to have this vehicle supported by tanks that had armament that could protect it from, you know, weapons that have standardized uh, armament, such as guns, cannons, machine guns. This thing should have just been packed up with a number of these missiles. You know, the missile itself didn't do so great, which is, I guess, one of its biggest downfalls. If you're going to make a good anti-tank weapon platform, you better make sure that the missiles you're going to put on it work effectively, because if they don't, well, then you're kind of just defeating the purpose. The 301P missiles were kind of its Achilles heel at the beginning, and the progressively, I think they just didn't really know what they exactly wanted from it. It's almost like they're trying to beef up a BMP-1, and you know put these new fancy cannons on there and make it all low profile but at the end of the day it was just a tank with two very poor cannons on it with the capability of launching a missile i don't like the fact that this vehicle was placed upon only two crew members to operate that's a lot of stress a lot of uh, things to think about on the battlefield a lot of critical processes that if you don't get right you or your crew member of the you know tank itself are done for and that's uh, you know a little bit of a hindsight i think that they've looked at, you know, in the future, even with the T-14 Armada, there's still a three-man crew, even though, you know, it's a remotely operated turret. You need the ability for people to, you know, command their own specific area, and commanding a vehicle alone is very hard. Trust me, I've commanded track fighting vehicles before. It's a lot on the brain, it's a lot on the tactical, operational, you know, mindset that you've got to have. But throw in the, you know, technicalities of operating an anti-tank guided missile, that's not an easy feat, especially trying to do two things at once. So I hope you enjoyed learning something about the Object 287 today, everyone. Please leave me a like if you did enjoy the video, and if I did make any mistakes, feel free to correct me in the comment section below. If you want to check out any of my links in the description box below, you're more than welcome to, including my merchandise store, my Facebook, my Discord, uh, my Patreon, which I can't thank you all enough for doing uh, support and donations towards that page. It really does mean a lot to me. Um, if you want to be notified of any upcoming videos, please feel free to hit the little bell button by the subscribe button so you can be updated of any upcoming content in the future. Have a wonderful day, everyone, and I will see you again next time. All the best. Bye-bye.